Today on the Sark Finder podcast, an interview with one of the leading authorities on the disease. I'll ask Dr. Simon Hart his best reasons as to what causes sarcoidosis, what it is, why our bodies react the way they do, and whether there's any hope for a cure. All of this on the next episode of the Sark Finder podcast. This is the Sark Fighter Podcast, living with sarcoidosis and other rare diseases. Here's your host, John Carlin. Hello and welcome to the Sark Fighter Podcast. I'm your host, John Carlin. I call myself the Sark Fighter. I am fighting sarcoidosis myself, but also in a larger sense with this podcast and some of my volunteer work we'll hear about here in a moment. I'm also working to fight sarcoidosis on behalf of you and all of the folks uh, that maybe your caregivers, your doctors, researchers, whoever is impacted by this disease, all, all of us to get together are fighting sarcoidosis and thus the Sark Fighter podcast. This is episode two. I'm making this recording on February 19th, 2020. And today I'll be interviewing Dr. Simon Hart. He is from the Hull York Medical School all the way from the United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Hart has a great British accent. I think you'll enjoy listening to that. But more than that, he is one of the world's leading authorities on sarcoidosis. And, you know, as we start this podcast, the Sark Fighter podcast, I thought that we should start out with some very basic episodes where we talked about, you know, what is sarcoidosis? Where does it come from? Or why don't we know more about sarcoidosis? Some of the, uh, I don't want to call them frequently asked questions, but if you are like me and you're relatively early in your journey with sarcoidosis, you may be finding this podcast and, man, you just want answers to these questions. Uh, but I also think that even for longtime uh, sufferers of sarcoidosis, you will find some insight in Dr. Uh, Hart's answers. So I asked the people at the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research who would be the best person to do this particular podcast on this topic with, and they immediately suggested Dr. Hart. Uh, it worked out great, and I think you'll agree it's a, it's a very compelling uh, interview. He has some wonderful things to say. So more on the good doctor in just a moment. Let me tell you that I am officially now, yay, me, uh, an advocate for FSR, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Uh, it's a volunteer position, but you do have to apply for it. And I'll be going for training this weekend in Washington, D.C. In fact, by the time you hear this podcast, I probably will have already been at that training. But there's so much that I want to learn there about the foundation, about sarcoidosis. I want to listen to other patients and other advocates. And I really want to get my head wrapped around the whole effort uh, from the sarcoidosis community to battle this disease. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to my time. We're meeting in, I say Washington, D.C. It's actually in, in Chevy Chase, Maryland. And I'm really expecting my eyes to be open. And then hopefully uh, I can help open your eyes or your ears, as it were, since this is a podcast. Um, and may, I might even actually record some interviews with people while I'm there. I'll be taking my equipment with me and, and hoping that uh, I can make it portable. I think, I think that can work. Anyway, so that's coming up this weekend. Very excited about that. Uh, again, my goal here is to interview a cross-section of people. I want to talk to patients so we can kind of hear their stories. Uh, it's helped me immensely to hear from other people. Uh, I also want to talk to researchers like Dr. Hart and other people who are right there on the front lines to fundraisers so, because they face a very significant struggle. Every fundraiser does, no matter what the cause. Uh, but sarcoidosis poses some challenges in particular. So yeah, I want to hear about that. I want to talk about that. I want to help shine a light on what they're doing. And then any, really any anybody else with something significant to say about sarcoidosis. 
So uh, this is episode two. Again, uh, my story, the John Carlin story, is on episode one. And I basically laid it all out there for you guys. Uh, this is this is what I've been dealing with. I won't go into it now, but I'm four years into it, and I have sarcoidosis on my spinal cord, and it's it's had a pretty negative impact on my life. Um, certainly, I've heard worse stories, uh, but at any rate, uh, I've put that out there in episode one. And if you're curious, please. Uh, Download episode one and, and and give it a listen. Now, before we get to the interview with Dr. Hart today, a couple of uh, calendar-related events. And if you have something, uh, you can email me at sarkfighter at gmail.com. Uh, and I will be happy to include this because I want everybody who's doing anything having to do with Sark to, uh, you know, get this information out there. So uh, we actually here in my home city of Roanoke, Virginia, are working with the Carillion Clinic, which was our major medical center and medical school here. Uh, we're doing an event coming up on April 21st. It'll be at the Grandin Theater in Roanoke at 7 p.m. We'll have some doctors speaking. Uh, we'll be showing a short video. I'll be telling more about my story and basically emceeing the event. And we are hoping that we can get as many people as possible there, uh, patients who uh, just want to be involved with this. And then maybe a support group will grow out of it. And Carillion has been extremely gracious. They'll be providing food. The Grandin Theater is providing the space. And you know, we have gotten a great deal of support from the community at large for this program. So that's coming up on April 21st, 2020, Grandin Theater, Roanoke, Virginia. If you're anywhere in Virginia, Southwest Virginia, neighboring West Virginia, North Carolina, you might want to uh, consider putting this on your calendar and coming to it. Um, I'd love it if you want to travel farther than that, but I, but I understand. Also, uh, also coming up, the uh, Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research has numerous summits that are happening soon, and they will be in Chicago on April 3rd through the 5th, in Miami, June 26th through the 28th, and in Portland, Oregon, September 11th through the 13th. What is a summit? Well, uh, they're replacing their traditional day-long conferences with three weekend-long summits this year in 2020. I just gave you the dates. They provide support resources and workshops about emotional health, navigation of the healthcare system, and self-care, in addition to uh, greater opportunities for connecting with other individuals living with or caring for someone with sarcoidosis. And I'll put a link to that uh, to their website in the show notes with the podcast. Now, I do want to hear from you. I want to know what you have going on, and we I want to share with other people just snippets of your sarcoidosis story. If we should decide that uh, sitting down and doing an interview is worthwhile, fantastic. But it, just in the meantime, I, when I went on television, and I am a, a local television news anchor, um, and I started to look really strange to my longtime viewers because I was taking so much prednisone. So I went on the air and we did a story on what was going on with me. And people started coming out of the woodwork to tell me their uh, either prednisone stories or sarcoidosis stories. And one of those people was Laura Drinkard, uh, who wrote to me the following... Hi, John. I'm not battling sarcoidosis, but I am battling three separate autoimmune diseases, and I have been on prednisone for the last 21 years since I was 22. It has been so tough for everyone, wondering why I've gained weight and looked so different over the years, and I appreciate you shedding light on autoimmune disease and chronic illness as a whole. I have been there also with the procedures, many IV treatments, hospital stays, the list could go on and on, and many very serious illnesses, one that almost took me from here. So obviously a very serious situation for Laura. She continues, chronic illnesses are definitely a struggle no matter what. God bless you. You are definitely added to my prayer list. Thank you for sharing your struggles. So um, that's thank you, Laura, for sharing that with us. And folks, you can also email me, you know, your thoughts, your struggles, whatever it is at uh, sarkfighter at gmail.com. Again, there'll be a link in the show notes. But let's uh, let's move on towards the interview now. 
Uh, here is a little bit more about uh, Simon Hart, Dr. Simon Hart. He is a reader in respiratory medicine at Hull York Medical School, the University of Hull, and a consultant physician at Hull University Teaching Hospitals NHS Trust. I'm reading you directly from his bio online. He graduated from Edinburgh University and trained in respiratory and general medicine in Southeast Scotland. He has a PhD in neutrophil and macrophage biology in the MRC Center for Inflammation Research, followed by an MRC Clinician Scientist Fellowship. And he is the lead clinician for the Hull uh, Interstital, I think I'm saying that right, Lung Disease and Sarcoidosis Services. He participates in the Acute General Medicine Rota at the Hull Royal Infirmary. His research interests include the biology of pulmonary fibrosis, uh, interstitial lung diseases, and sarcoidosis. Here now is my interview with Dr. Simon Hart. Well, hello and welcome to the Sark Fighter podcast. I'm joined today by Dr. Simon Hart of the Hull York Medical School in England, or Great Britain. Uh, uh, Dr. Hart, what's the better way to refer to that uh, when I'm talking to somebody across the pond? Are we uh, United Kingdom or UK? Uh, UK. would be fine, John. Okay, very good. Well, welcome to the Sark Fighter podcast. I appreciate you joining me today. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So um, today, you know, we want to talk about uh, sarcoidosis and, uh, you know, I've, I've reached out, I'm working with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research in Chicago and I said, who is the, uh, the best person to talk about this? And without hesitation, they gave me your name. So uh, I understand you're the guy. Wow, I'm, I'm honored that they, they mentioned me first. <laughs> well, they did. Yeah. And, and so we're very early on in the Sark Fighter podcast. These episodes will live on the internet uh, in perpetuity. And so I'm going to go over some, some very basic questions that people who are somehow touched by this illness or disease are, are uh, affected by. And I want to start right out and ask you, what, what is sarcoidosis? Well, sarcoidosis is a usually chronic disease, though a disease that goes on for some time. And um, it's very variable between how it affects different people. But a characteristic feature from a pathological point of view is uh, these uh, granulomas, uh, which are something that the body produces when it's trying to get rid of something or trying to kill something, but it can't and it's an inflammatory or immune-mediated response. And these granulomas can affect various parts of the body, but commonly the lungs, the lymph glands, the skin, and the eyes, but sometimes the heart, sometimes the nervous system, sometimes the liver, sometimes the bones. So it can occur almost, almost anywhere and mimic and be similar to other diseases. So sometimes it can be difficult to diagnose. It affects different people in different ways. Sometimes it comes on quickly, sometimes it comes on slowly. So it is a very variable disease. Um, and that's maybe one of the reasons why it's been difficult to study in clinical trials, for example, is that different people are affected in different ways. So in terms of deciding what you want to measure uh, as an outcome of your potential treatment uh, is difficult in that situation. And I I'll get into uh, some questions with you about all those difficulties in a little while, but yeah. um, what what is a granuloma? I mean, can you look at it if you were holding it in your hand or on your finger? What would it look like? Yeah, so so they're 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 very small and best seen under the microscope. So we're talking about um, a millimeter or so in size, but very characteristic appearance under the microscope. And we you know, we teach the medical students at an early stage what a granuloma looks like because it's so characteristic. It's like an organized collection of the body's immune cells, where in the middle, um, it, it, I mean, you could imagine it as, as uh, spherical or, or, or football shaped. Uh, in the middle is a collection of big cells called macrophages, uh, which are part of the immune system, and they're particularly good at eating and ingesting bacteria and other bugs. And around the outside is a collection of other immune cells, predominantly lymphocytes, uh, which are involved in immunological memory. And there are some other cells there as well, but they're very characteristic. 
granulomas occur in other conditions. And, and the classic example of a granulomatous disease that, that is very common is tuberculosis, TB. So TB is caused by infection with a bacterium called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And the thing about Mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria is they're not particularly nasty or aggressive and they don't really produce many toxins or poisons. But the body and particularly the macrophage cells try to uh, kill, they eat them and try to kill these bacteria, but they're very resistant to being killed. They're very tough. And it seems to be that ongoing body's immune reaction against something that it's trying to get rid of but can't that leads to, to this organized collection of cells uh, which make up the granuloma that we can see under the microscope. And in sarcoidosis, um, these granulomas are what cause the damage in various different tissue, the lungs, the lymph glands, the skin, etc. Got you. So um, I, 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 I listen to this and then I hear, uh, I hear you saying that the, uh, the granulomas and the macrophages, if I'm saying that properly, they all rush to the body's defense when the body senses that there's something that needs defending. And my, my very rudimentary understanding, you've got to forgive me here, of an autoimmune disease is where all these defenses come to a spot in your body that really doesn't need defending. Do I understand that properly? No, you're, you're absolutely right there, John. But the big question um, that has troubled sarcoidosis researchers for 100 years is, is sarcoidosis actually due to an infection or some foreign particle or something outside the body, which the body is responding to? Or is it, as, as you're suggesting, an autoimmune disease where the body is reacting against itself? So it's certainly reacting against something. And clearly, if we could find out what that something is, um, then we'll be well on the way to establishing a cause for sarcoidosis and then better treatments. The problem is 100 plus years of research has failed to identify what that something is that's driving the immune response. And immunologists, um, the word that they use to describe that something is an antigen, something that turns on the immune system and the immune response and leads to these uh, series of reactions. And the nature of the antigen or, uh, or antigens in sarcoidosis remain elusive. And I say antigens because, of course, it's possible that it's something, it's different things in different people. Um, it would be, it'd be simple if it was one thing uh, to cause all sarcoidosis, but it's possible it could be something different triggering it in different people. And that it makes it, uh, I'm sure, very elusive. Um, now, some people get sarcoidosis and within months or a couple of years, it just goes away. And in other people, uh, myself included, it does not go away. Um, and you wind up with all these dreadful um, medications that are used to treat it. Now, I'll, I'll get into the medications a little later in our conversation. But in what percentage of the cases does it just go away? And in what percentage are people like me looking at maybe suffering with this for uh, the duration of our lives? Yeah. You're absolutely right. And, and in, a, in a fair proportion of cases, John, it will either go away or seem to go away once it's appeared. And, you know, rough, roughly half of cases that will happen. And so that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a lot. Um, one thing to say about that before we, before we get into that in any more detail, that makes, again, a, a very challenging disease to study in clinical trials because you've got half of people who've got sarcoidosis in whom it will seem to go away by itself. So if you give some treatment in that situation, it looks like the treatment works. But in fact, it was going to go away by itself. And this has been, again, recognized for many years. And you know, in the 1950s, many different strange drugs and chemicals were purported to be good treatments for sarcoidosis. But that's because um, it has a tendency to go away by itself and, the, and, and proper controlled studies weren't done. If, if the sarcoidosis seems to come on quickly, uh, what we would call an acute type presentation of sarcoidosis, it seems to be more likely 
that it will then go away. So it comes on quite fast, sometimes in quite a troublesome fashion, uh, but it's almost like the immune system gets on top of it, controls it, and it seems to go away, and you know, nine out of 10 people won't be troubled again in the future. It's the type of sarcoidosis that seems to come on in a more slow and insidious and grumbling fashion, more chronic type sarcoidosis, which is then going to persist. Why does sometimes it go away and sometimes persist or progress and get worse and lead to uh, progressive symptoms and organ damage? Um, we don't really understand that. In simple terms, I think it's a balance between these antigens, whichever, whatever they are that are driving the immune response and the nature of the immune response and how your body responds to it, whether they manage to get everything under control or not. And I think it's that balance which can go either way, uh, which determines how the disease behaves. Um, but if, you know, if we could get a better handle on why in, in many cases it seems to be self-resolving, um, again, I think we'd, be, we'd have a better understanding and we'd be uh, further along the way to develop better treatments. Uh, the other thing just to add is, in many cases, it seems to go away, but it probably hasn't gone away completely. It's just under control, in balance with the immune system and the body, grumbling at a low level behind and not causing any trouble. And the reason I say that is because if uh, it seems to go away, but if you were to do further tests or scans or biopsies, you, know, you, you can still find these granulomas there, but they're, not, you know, but they're all under control and it's not causing any trouble. Some cases, I, it, indeed, it does truly burn out and go away and there's nothing left. If I had to guess, I would say that I'm one of those people where it's sort of functioning in the background and I don't want to get into my own case uh, too much. I, I, I have, uh, for, for your benefit, uh, so you know where I'm coming from and for listeners, and again, listeners were speaking with Dr. Simon Hart at Hull York Medical School in the UK, uh, who is a leading authority on sarcoidosis. Um, I have it on my, uh, on my spinal cord. And unfortunately, it's very high in my spinal cord. And so as my brain tries to talk to the lower extremities of my body, uh, all that signal is being interrupted and it's resulted in, uh, in any number of issues for me. Uh, but, and if it gets any worse, I, I won't be walking around anymore. I'll, I'll be in a wheelchair or, you know, or worse than that. Uh, in fact, several uh, neurologists have told me when they look at my scans of my spinal cord, that uh, they can't believe that I'm walking. And in fact, you know, I'm walking, I'm up around, I'm working, you know, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I ride my bicycle uh, a lot. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, a, I'm able to do all this uh, and I'm taking Humira now and I want to ask you about medications again later in our interview. But, um, you know, but I feel like there's little twitchy things, rashes and whatnot that are indicative of sarcoidosis, according to my reading and discussions with my doctors. I feel like it's probably under control on my spinal cord because I don't sense that's getting worse. But part of it may be aging. I'm pushing 60 uh, and it's just stuff that's happening to me as I get older. But I, every little thing that happens, I feel like that's a, a sign that the sarcoidosis is still sort of out there in the background. Am I, am I reading that right? Possibly, likely. Yeah, no, absolutely right, John. And and for many people with a more chronic form of sarcoidosis, I think it's important to have realistic expectations that what what we're trying to achieve there is control. And sometimes control and stability is the best that can be achieved, and that's a, that's a good target of treatment. And to um, and to expect it to melt away and disappear with or without treatment is 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 often unrealistic in that situation. And, you know, so we shouldn't, we should have realistic expectations of, uh, of, of what, what treatment is aimed to do in sarcoidosis. And I think the other thing just worth mentioning uh, related to your story, of course, um, it not only matters, you know, how many granulomas or how extensive uh, the disease is with sarcoidosis, but where it is, because a few little spots of granulomas in one part of the lung, for example, you know, we would, would, we would probably almost ignore those and say, well, they're not going to cause much trouble. But the same spots either in the heart or in the nervous system 
could cause um, all sorts of trouble. So even low burden disease in the wrong place uh, could be extremely troublesome. Yeah, and that's, um, that's one of the frustrations that I have is why did it have to show up on my spinal cord? A friend of mine uh, saw that I was blogging about this and, and, and talking about it, and, and I hadn't heard from him other than sort of Facebook communication in 25 years, and, and he said, wow, I have it in my heart. And he's very early, and so in in his um, journey with it, uh, but he's obviously concerned, and you know, like it just really doesn't seem fair when it shows up in one of these places where it can do all this damage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, now, a couple of other things. Uh, another uh, friend contacted me and said he had non-casating granuloma in his lungs. It did go away, but did he have, would you call that sarcoidosis or would you call that something else? Yeah, so as we've, as we've already discussed, there are um, uh, other things that cause granulomas. Uh, TB is the classic example, but other infections, um, other bacteria like TB, fungal infections uh, caused by yeasts and fungi, um, certain... Um, exposure to certain metals, uh, for example, beryllium, which is a light metal used in the electronics industry. Um, these can all cause granulomatous or granulomas that look similar to sarcoid. So what we're looking for in order to make a diagnosis of sarcoid is, is, is the right sort of story or the right sort of patient, patient history, the right clinical features, the right sort of um, imaging, so X-ray, CT scan uh, or MRI, for example, um, the presence of these granulomas and combine the clinical radiological and pathological features um, whilst at the same time excluding other things that cause granulomatous inflammation. So that's TB and other infections, for example. So a compatible clinical picture, compatible imaging, granulomas, but no evidence of these other things would then allow us to say, this is sarcoidosis, but finding a granuloma by itself or granulomas by themselves would not be sufficient to call it sarcoid. Got it. And that, that was new information to me uh, because I said to my friend, well, you've got sarcoidosis. You have what I have. And he said, no, the doctor, doctor said I didn't. And I thought, oh, well, if you had a non-casing granuloma, which is what people told me that, that I had after a biopsy on my spine, um, I just thought that that was a long way of saying sarcoidosis. If 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 some if you have a granu someone has a granulomatous disease that seems to get better by itself, as we've already said, that's a common scenario in sarcoid. Again, that makes it more likely to be sarcoidosis, but not definitely. It could be an infection which uh, the immune system has responded to appropriately. So it is very important. Uh, to rule out other causes, especially infection. Got it. Okay. Um, so now we've talked about autoimmune and then uh, the, the folks at the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research say their talking points don't use the word autoimmune anymore. They use the word autoinflammatory. Is, is hmm. that correct? And yeah. what's the difference? Yeah, I think, I think some people would use these terms interchangeably. So, um, an immune response is something your body generates in, in, in response to a particular antigen. Inflammation, on the other hand, is a general term that, that describes your body's response to any sort of injury or insult. So autoinflammatory is a little bit more of a general term that's not specifying that there has to be a particular immune response. I don't think there's too much too much between those two terms, really. Okay. All right. Well, that that makes me feel a little better. Um, for instance, if someone has rheumatoid arthritis, as I understand it, um, what you have is some sort of an autoimmune response in your joints, which creates inflammation. The inflammation in your joints is what causes the pain and the stiffness and the difficulty in moving, and so in effect, what you have is an inflammatory response to some sort of stimulus, right? Absolutely correct. 
Okay, good. Got that right then. So yeah. um, if I say autoimmune instead of auto, autoinflammatory, you're not going to ding me. Definitely not, John. Definitely not. <laughs> okay. How many people have sarcoidosis in the world, in the well, UK, in the United States? Yeah, I mean, you know, so, so if, if you look at the figures, it, again, very variable between um, different parts of the world, different populations. As a rough um, incidence figure, that is new cases, um, you... 10 per 100,000 per year is, is commonly used. So if you have a population of 100,000 people, um, a tenth of a million, then maybe on average 10 or so new cases within that population per year. Um, so that would be an average figure. It's more common in black people, so Africans, African-Americans, probably about three times as common. Um, uh, for again, for reasons that we don't fully understand, um, less common than in than that than in white people. It seems to be quite common, it, commonly reported in Scandinavians and Eastern Europeans, but they tend to have a different sort of spectrum of disease. So in Scandinavia, it's very commonly the acute, fast onset, self-resolving type disease uh, that occurs in Scandinavia. Um, there some, seems to be some seasonal difference in, in when it tends to come on, more common in the spring and early summer for, 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 for some reason. Um, in the Far East, in Japan, it's, it's le much less common than, it, than, than in other parts of the world. So ethnic variations, geographical variations, seasonal variation. Um, so it's not a common disease, but there's enough of it around um, that, you know, it crops up in medical practice, not infrequently. I wish it cropped up more so I wouldn't have to explain it to so many people. <laughs> um, there, there, there are, yeah, having, having a rare disease um, has its challenges. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm sure, and sir, on the research side that it, that it does as well. Uh, absolutely, and, absolutely. And yeah. do, do you look at this and you say this is a cultural cause? In other words, why would African-Americans and Scandinavians, is it something they're eating? Is it someplace they live? Um, or is it more driven by DNA or environment? Yeah. Any ideas? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the old uh, genes versus environment um, yeah. uh, arguments. And of course, you know, the usual kind of cop out and it is with sarcoidosis as well it seems to be a bit of both so from the genes point of view a number of genes have been identified that confer risk you know it's not a genetically inherited disease in the sense that if you have an abnormal gene you get the disease and if you don't you don't but like many diseases um, there are genetic variations that can confer an increased risk of getting sarcoidosis and interestingly many of those genetic variations relate to the way that the immune system reacts to an antigen, that is a, a foreign protein, uh, antigens we've already mentioned. And the way that those uh, antigens are reacted to and processed um, seems to influence your risk of sarcoidosis, which again is in keeping with this idea that there's some antigen, some protein or other, which is, which is triggering the immune response. In terms of the, in, the environment, um, or the idea of genes versus env environment, um, twin studies are quite interesting. So, um, so sarcoidosis is more common in identical twins than, uh, than in other people um, who, who don't have an identical twin. So, so uh, that may be genes or it may be environment because of course identical twins share, share both of those things. Um, Studies have been done looking at environmental risk factors. So um, big, what are called epidemiological studies um, have been done to try and work out uh, what people with sarcoidosis have been exposed to as part of their job, their work, their life, their leisure, um, that, that puts them at increased risk. And these studies involve asking um, people with sarcoidosis and control people without sarcoidosis, lots of questions about what they've been exposed to. 
Um, and there have been ideas that, you know, occupational exposure to dust or musty environments um, may, may put people at increased risk of sarcoidosis. But my take on those studies, John, is that they've all been very disappointing. You know, nothing very conclusive has come out of these big epidemiology studies trying to look at what exposures people have that increases their risk of getting sarcoidosis. And that's, um, and that's very disappointing. So we're still left in the, in the situation where, yes, genes are important. They can put you at increased risk, but environment seems to be important as well. I'm going to take a flyer here. I just want to ask a question uh, related to my own experience. Um, I used to be a, uh, a marathon runner, uh, ran the Boston Marathon a couple of times, and you know, I was able to, in my 30s and 40s, you know, run 26 miles at around seven and a half minutes a mile. I felt pretty, pretty good about that. It, that would be good enough to make me finish like 10,000th in the Boston Marathon. But, uh, but I started getting this onset in my calves years before this presented in my spine. And I found one clinical study on the internet where sarcoidosis does sometimes present in your calves. Um, and at the time, I just thought it was an overuse injury, but it would tighten my calves up. It was not, it was not a, uh, a cramp, which was something I was intimately familiar with. Have you ever heard of, of it presenting in the calves? I've personally not come across that, John. It, you know, we know that sarcoidosis can affect any part of the body, so theoretically it could affect the skin, the muscles, all the bones, all the nerves in the calves. Uh, I don't have any patients who are affected in the lower legs that way. Yeah, I just, I just wondered if maybe I had this running around in my body for years before mm -hmm. it was diagnosed in 2016 in my, yeah. um, on my spinal cord. Um, yeah, so I, I just guess, I didn't I, know if that was yeah. it or if that could have been it. Yeah, we, we, you know, we, we don't know so much about the natural history of the disease before it causes the main symptoms. And um, right. uh, naturally, because people won't get investigated or have tests if they don't have any symptoms. So yeah. um, these are some of the unknowns, I agree. Yeah, I went through a whole regimen of stretching and, you know, those types of things. Uh, and, and nothing ever really worked. And I wound up not being able mm. to run because even when I was in shape to run 10 or 15 miles, I would run a mile and this would set in. Um, mm. So it did, you know, that not typical of cramping or anything like that. Don't want to get off on, on my case too much, but I, I would imagine whoever is listening to this podcast um, has had some sort of something unusual happen that they decided to dedicate an hour of their life to, uh, to listen to us talk about sarcoidosis. Um, why is it so prevalent in the lungs? Do we know? Um, this seems to relate to this exposure idea that the the granulomas occur due to an immune response to something from outside that we're exposed to so something that we then breathe in uh, so that ends up in the lungs and then what ends up in the lungs will tend to travel to the lymph glands in the middle of the chest the so-called mediastinal lymph nodes and those are very commonly enlarged and affected by sarcoidosis one of the commonest places that we would see it um, that exposure idea um, would also explain sarcoidosis in the eyes and the skin, and then sometimes in the salivary glands, which, uh, which is a recognized uh, way that it can appear. Um, so that fits with, a, with something that we're exposed to, that we inhale, uh, dust, aerosol, etc., that we're exposed to, and then there's an immune uh, reaction to it. Um, I think you know, some of the figures about which different bits of the body are most affected are sometimes you have to take them with a little pinch of salt because of course it depends how hard you look and, and also which type of doctor uh, sees you. Yes. So if you've got sarcoidosis of your eyes, then, uh, uh, then, then eye specialists will say that sarcoidosis very commonly affects the eyes and lung doctors will say it very commonly affects the lungs. There's no doubt that these are the common targets, eyes, lungs, lymph glands, skin would be the commonest. Right. Uh, how, how often do you see sarcoidosis being fatal? This is uh, fortunately uh, very uncommon. So yes, there are unfortunate people who have progressive organ damage 
Uh, it seems to be a consequence of what we call fibrosis, which is scarring, which is a kind of end result of chronic inflammation. So pulmonary fibrosis in the lungs is, is scarring of the lungs due to chronic inflammation. And sometimes that does happen. Uh, but fortunately, um, sarcoidosis is not usually a fatal disease. It can be, uh, but fortunately not. And most of the burden of sarcoidosis is with symptoms, with impaired quality of life, and potentially um, economic burden, because it's a, it tends to be a disease of working age people. So there's an economic problem there for the people affected um, and, and for the general economy as well. Yeah. How often do you, uh, do you see sarcoidosis in the nervous system like I have? Yeah. So again, fortunately, uh, not so commonly, but it can affect the spinal cord like yourself. It can affect the brain. It can affect the meninges, which is the outside lining of the brain and spinal cord. And it can affect the uh, peripheral nerves as well. Um, Fortunately, these uh, types of presentations of neurosarcoidosis are uncommon. Um, how, you know, as, as you're speculating, how, how, does it, how does it get there? Why does it start there? Um, uh, we don't understand that. But fortunately, it's, it's uncommon. Well, um, I'm glad to hear that for the, for the sake of other people. The Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is the nation's leading nonprofit organization dedicated to finding the cure for this disease and to improving care for sarcoidosis patients worldwide. Since its establishment in 2000, FSR has fostered over $5 million in sarcoidosis-specific research efforts and has provided disease education and support for thousands of individuals navigating life with sarcoidosis. Learn more about FSR and how they're supporting those impacted by this disease at www.stopsarcoidosis.org. You're listening to the Sark Fighter podcast, and we are speaking with Dr. Simon Hart from the Hull York Medical School in the UK. He is a leading authority on sarcoidosis, and he's answering a lot of uh, frequently asked questions uh, for us today. Uh, these are frequently asked by me and I'm sure uh, by other people who suffer with sarcoidosis, whether they be caregivers, researchers, etc. Although one would hope that at least the researchers already know the answers to these questions. Uh, Dr. Dr. Hart, um, there are, you mentioned a moment ago uh, that there, it depends upon what kind of doctor you have. Um, mm. I have uh, my primary doctor at Carillion Medical Center, Carillion Clinic here in Roanoke, Virginia, is a rheumatologist. I'm also seeing doctors at the Cleveland Clinic. One is a neurologist because that's where I have sarcoidosis. And one is a pulmonologist because I guess, as we said, most people have this in their lungs. And so most of the people coming to the Cleveland Clinic for treatment uh, need a pulmonologist. I, I would imagine that it always takes uh, a village of doctors to treat this disease, mm. does it not? Yeah, and that's a, that's a challenge then, isn't it? Because uh, ensuring good communication and understanding between those different uh, specialties of doctors uh, can be difficult. The critical thing is that your doctor or doctors understand sarcoidosis. And as we've already said, we, we, we don't understand the cause of sarcoidosis, but, they, but, but uh, sarcoidosis specialists do understand how it behaves. That's something that we've talked about today, isn't it? This fact that in many people, when it comes on, it will get better by itself. So all you need to know there is to do nothing is often the best thing to do initially anyway, until you get a feel for how the disease is behaving. So it is important that your specialists or specialists understand sarcoidosis. Um, but you will often need a doctor focusing on the specific area that most affects you with your sarcoidosis. So a neurologist if you have neurosarcoidosis, an ophthalmologist if you have sarcoidosis affecting your eyes, a pulmonologist if you have sarcoidosis affecting the lungs. Um, and then good communication between all of your uh, specialists is absolutely critical. And difficult 
Um, <laughs> well, I, I uh, have, uh, one of my specialists, one of the neurologists uh, that I have had uh, who's moved on from my immediate area um, was recommending a uh, cytoxin treatment while another doctor, my rheumatologist, was recommending Remicade. And the doctors could not agree on what was the best path forward for me. This was fairly early on in my diagnosis. And I, as the patient, am trying to figure out which doctor to listen to. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Yeah. made me want to pull my hair out. Yeah. I mean, you know, the fact that sarcoidosis very commonly affects the lungs, as you said, John, is it means that there are um, some pulmonology specialists who are familiar with sarcoidosis as a whole and are also familiar with the clinical evidence and the results of clinical trials of various different treatments that you've mentioned there. Um, and also understand that for many of the potential treatments or possible treatments that might be offered, that there is no strong evidence based for that, but that sometimes in conversation with a patient, it may be uh, the, best, uh, the best option uh, to take. Um, I think it's, it's that overall understanding of the whole sarcoidosis field uh, that's the most important thing. There certainly is, uh, uh, there are a large group of, of pulmonologists who, who understand that, but there will be specialists uh, within each of the other organ systems who have that particular uh, knowledge or an expertise in sarcoidosis as well. Uh, so, yeah, so that's, it's just, it's difficult uh, when the doctors don't agree on what the best path forward is. And, and it, it yeah. seems to me, in having dealt with multiple medical centers now, because doctors move on in, in the United States, I don't know if that's common in the UK or not, but uh, I've been at the University of Virginia Medical Center, I've been uh, at Carillion here in Roanoke, and I've been, uh, and I'm still working with doctors uh, also at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, but every, one, every once in a while, I'll just the doctor will say, well, I'm retiring or I'm moving to another medical center. And so I wind up, you know, having to uh, deal with a new doctor, a new physician. And I wind up with a whole new set of opinions that I maybe wasn't yeah. prepared to deal with. Um, uh, is I, I think, yeah, I, is, I think that there are, there are so many uh, treatment options in sarcoidosis, John, that are that have very little evidence for them and are unproven. Now, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be used, but what that means is there needs to be a very frank conversation between doctor and patient in that situation about what is known about this proposed treatment option, what it might or might not do, what the downsides might be, and if you know we agree between us, doctor plus patient, in agreement that this is what we're going to do then how long are we going to give that treatment for? What are we going to measure uh, to decide whether uh, treatment response uh, has been successful? What are we aiming for? As we touched on earlier, are we aiming for improvement or are we aiming for stability and control? And all of these things need to be part of that uh, discussion. And I think if, you, uh, uh, if, if you're in consultation with a doctor who just tells you this is the treatment you should have, um, no discussion, then I think you should go and see somebody else. I actually did that once. I, I had one meeting with doctor. He, and he, I think he was frustrated by sarcoidosis. I, I don't want to get into his psyche or thinking too much, but uh, he didn't offer me much hope and he didn't really want to have a discussion or a conversation. And so um, for the first time in my life, I fired my doctor. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, I think and, you did the right thing. Okay, well, thank you. And I, you know, I won't mention any names or anything like that. But it was it was frustrating to me because I I feel like if you don't have hope, then it's really difficult to go forward. If you don't feel like there is a some percentage of probability that whatever it is you're doing is going to work, um, yeah, you, you, it's just difficult to face this disease. Now, um, I want to talk about some of those medications. Um, the, when I got out of the hospital and I was first talking to doctors about sarcoidosis, which is something I had never heard of, they basically said there is a, a menu of medicines that we can try. Um, 
and methotrexate was the first one that they suggested. Are you surprised mm -hmm. by that? No, um, certainly. Um, for, so in general about principles of sarcoidosis, the, 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 the best treatment for many people is no treatment for reasons that we've discussed. If sarcoidosis is causing troublesome, persistent or progressive symptoms or impaired quality of life, or it seems to be dangerous, that is at risk of permanently damaging you, uh, then we try to suppress it. And what we try to do is give some treatment to suppress the formation of these granulomas and help the body uh, remove these granulomas. And the first line treatment, um, as you know, will tend to be corticosteroids. Um, and they do suppress sarcoidosis whilst patients continue to take them. But over time, they bring their own uh, list of potential side effects, which for many can be worse than the disease uh, sarcoidosis itself. Amen. And, then, <laughs> and then we may have um, a list of what are called second line immunomodulatory drugs, uh, which include methotrexate, as you mentioned. And certainly in the UK, uh, methotrexate uh, would be the most popular of those second line Im immunomodulators uh, as an option for sarcoidosis, I agree. Yeah, now, so you mentioned the corticosteroids. Uh, prednisone is the one that I uh, am unfortunately familiar with. And that yeah. has had a, uh, I, I've had two big rounds with the prednisone where I was taking 80 milligrams a day for, you know, months and months and months, and then uh, slowly dosing off at 10 milligrams per month and had the moon face and had all of the other issues associated with it. Uh, it works, but how long can or should you take it? And, and how do you yeah. draw that line between what's worse, the sarcoidosis or the prednisone? Yeah, yeah. Well, in, indeed, and this comes to the kind of contract that should be drawn up, uh, informal contract between doctor and patient at the beginning. Uh, what are we aiming to do? We are aiming for stability. We're we aiming for improvement. How much improvement? What are we going to measure uh, in order to be able to determine whether that improvement has happened or not? How long are we going to go on for? Uh, the longer you go on with corticosteroids like prednisone, uh, the more likely uh, the uh, problems like weight gain, the moon face, bone uh, thinning, blood pressure, diabetes, wound healing issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the more likely these problems are uh, to kick in. Um, so, you know, in that situation, once it's been decided to embark on uh, immunomodulation as the way to try and control the sarcoidosis, um, initial treatment with corticosteroids like prednisone in a kind of weaning down dose like you describe, uh, but then to come in with a second line drug like methotrexate for maintenance or long-term treatment. Um, methotrexate, for example, you know, like, like many of these drugs, takes a while to kick in. So you aim to get initial control with corticosteroids and then bring in something like the methotrexate for longer term control if you're a patient with sarcoidosis who needs to be treated with immunomodulation. Right. Um, and that's, that's, I wanted, I, I could probably uh, wear you out over a couple of beers with all the trouble I've had with, with prednisone. <laughs> You'd yeah. probably want to kill well, yourself I, I by the time I, I was be, done. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised um, that there are many people who run into big trouble with uh, steroid treatment in the longer term. And, and it's not an uncommon scenario. So for example, thinking about some of the, the evidence base for this. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, there was a trial done in the UK sponsored by the British Thoracic Society uh, comparing uh, uh, prednisolone, which is the steroid that we use in the UK, it was very similar to prednisone, um, uh, against no treatment in people with chronic sarcoidosis. And one of the things that came out of that was that if a patient started uh, corticosteroid prednisolone therapy, half of those patients were still taking them, the, the steroids, five years later. So once you start, um, half of people will still be taking the, these drugs five years later. So it can be difficult to get off uh, steroid treatment once you've started. Mm, interesting. Uh, well, what, what I did was um, 
I ultimately, uh, working with my doctors at the Cleveland Clinic, was on prednisone, and they recommended a, uh, a course of uh, cytoxin, which is a chemo drug. So I yeah. was taking the prednisone, and then every three or four weeks, depending upon where I was in my progress through last summer in 2019, uh, every time I would get a treatment of the cytoxin, they would allow me to reduce my prednisone treatment by 10 yeah. milligrams. Yeah. So every three weeks, yeah. I'd go to 70 to 60 to 50 to where now I'm at two and a half. And yeah. I hopefully we'll just stop taking it soon. Uh, and I've, the cytoxin has run its course. So I'm no longer uh, taking these dreadful chemo treatments, which 2019 was, was not a fun year for me in, in terms of, of everything. Um, but I still think, and now I'm taking Humira, which I want to ask you about in a moment. Um, yeah. But one of the things that did happen to me was in late 2018, as you mentioned, I was uh, coming off of taking Remicade because I was having liver issues and, and ramping up another drug, which I can't remember at the time. But I, again, I, I, I'm wondering and hoping that maybe this is something that resonates with people listening to the podcast right now, but I wound up having a flare, uh, which is, I, that's the term they use here in the, in the States, but all of a sudden I woke up one morning and I couldn't walk because I had big inflammation in my spinal cord, uh, which an MRI showed had gone from being located essentially in my neck to all the way down in the middle of my back. And I was, you know, I, I, I was having trouble uh, going to the bathroom. I, I had this inability to walk. And so then they, boom, they came in with uh, a thousand milligrams of something in a, a corticosteroid IV that you're smiling. So I see that that looks yeah, yeah. familiar to you. Yeah. And then me methyl prednisone probably. Yeah. Yeah, probably was. Um, anyway. Uh, and so I, I spent all of 2019 recovering from that flare and that, but that did cause new permanent damage. So for instance, I didn't used to have tingling in my arms and my hands, and now I do. It used to be located basically in, the, in my core, so from my chest down to my toes, I had this, you know, daily pins and needles, but now it's in my hands. Um, and so that was a flare, which was caused by a transition, which means probably the second medicine didn't kick in as the Remicade was being dosed down if I understand that properly. And that is, that's truly a threat to somebody when you think maybe this is in remission, all of a sudden it shows back up. Yeah, and, and, and absolutely right. And, and, and especially like in your case, John, where it's, uh, where it's neurosarcoidosis in the nervous system, where a little bit of change in size or a little bit more swelling uh, could make a whole lot of difference in the spinal cord. Uh, whereas if that, you know, if that sarcoid was in the muscle or in the lung, uh, again, you know, we, we might not, we might not even notice that there was a change there. So it just shows how critical, uh, where the disease is. Right. I would imagine that if somebody had it in their eyes or their heart or their ears, yeah. um, and again, a, a little bit of, uh, additional sarcoidosis activity results in, you know, blindness or deafness or, uh, so, you know, obviously that makes, that makes yeah. a big difference. So, yeah. um, so we see these commercials on television in the States for Humira. Uh, so I had heard of it, but I don't really know how it works or what it's doing. Uh, but that, that is working for me right now. Is that something that offers hope to other patients? Yeah. So, so Humira is one of a group of drugs that block the action of uh, a chemical mediator called TNF. And uh, uh, TNF has been identified a long time ago as one of the key chemical mediators. Again, immunologists call them cytokines, but they're chemicals that are released by the body's immune cells uh, that drive the formation of the granulomas, which are the, uh, the characteristic uh, features of, uh, feature of sarcoidosis, as, as we've discussed. And, um, you know, and, and you, you, know, you, can, you can go back to experimental systems. So um, you can induce granulomas in um, animal models um, with, for example, TB infection. Uh, but if you take a mouse that cannot make any TNF, um, then it will not be able to form any granulomas. So 
So there seem to be a few of these chemical mediators that are absolutely critical for granuloma formation. And drugs like Humira were, many of these drugs were developed not, not for sarcoidosis, that's maybe something we can come back to. Uh, they were developed for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but they do block the action of this key chemical mediator called TNF, and they do seem to be effective, therefore, in granulomatous inflammation in sarcoidosis. Um, so um, we, you know, we would certainly use uh, TNF blocking treatment, of which there are uh, a choice of different drugs, um, for selected patients, especially if the first line prednis prednisone and the second line methotrexate or similar drugs have not uh, not done the business. Right, and uh, it, it appears that Humira is expensive and insurance companies uh, in the States at least uh, tend to balk at it because it is not uh, a, a proven or common treatment for sarcoidosis. And, yeah. and yeah. So, the, so the doctor has to make a really strong case to the insurance company to get it approved. Yeah. Yeah. So in the UK, of course, we're slightly different. We have the, the uh, state funded national health service, but we have exactly the same issues in, in that the um, regulatory author authorities, in fact, do not recommend TNF blocking treatment uh, like Humira for the treatment of sarcoidosis. So again, we'd be in the same situation of having to make a special case uh, to get this treatment for one of our patients. Uh, which is uh, very difficult and challenging, especially in a disease for which other treatment is not working. So what is, what is your go-to when somebody comes in and they've got a, uh, a serious case of this where doing nothing is not an option? What, what is your go-to regimen? Well, um, our, our standard way of uh, doing it would be in the order that I've kind of described, to use in someone in whom we've decided that um, immunomodulatory or immunosuppressive treatment is what is required, uh, then initial control with corticosteroids like prednisone on a weaning dose. Introduction then of a second line immuno immunomodulatory agent to use in the longer term, and by that I mean for years, like methotrexate, but alternatives would be azathioprine or mycophenolate mofetil. All of these are uh, drugs that uh, can be used to suppress the immune response. And if that fails, we would then go to uh, what we might call a biologic type agent or a called biologic agents, uh, like the TNF blocking drugs like Humira, for example, if we could uh, persuade the authorities uh, that this was, a, uh, this was a case of need. And for instance, in my case, it appears to be working uh, yeah. I don't know how many patients you've had who've taken Humira, how many patients there are with sarcoidosis, sarcoidosis who are taking Humira, but um, isn't that, is, are there case studies? I mean, what, do you, what do we have to do if this actually works to uh, get the insurance companies to fund it more easily? Well, the, um, you know, there, as I said, in, for many treatments in sarcoidosis, there's a lack of good evidence but in fact there have been um, randomized controlled trials so that's uh, a high quality way of assessing a treatment of uh, TNF uh, blocking drugs um, in uh, people with difficult sarcoidosis so uh, uh, Professor Bob Baufman in Cincinnati um, who's who's led on much of the clinical trial work in in sarcoidosis worldwide um, his group have uh, done a study of TNF blocking uh, drug in sarcoidosis and uh, shown benefit. So there is actually good clinical trial uh, evidence of the benefit of TNF blockade uh, in sarcoidosis, um, which makes it difficult to understand why it's so difficult to get for our patients. Um, I, I agree that we shouldn't use it first line, but as a, as a, if, the, if the other approach is not working, um, then it's got to be the next thing to do. I, I agree. So we, speaking of the next thing, one of the uh, issues that I've heard expressed multiple times is that it's hard to 
secure funding for sarcoidosis research because there are so many other illnesses that are sort of in line first because they affect more people. Is that an accurate yes. assessment? Yeah, this is, uh, this is the challenge with, with rare diseases as a whole, John, and trying to justify um, research into a rare disease like sarcoidosis when there, of course, there are so many other uh, deserving um, and dangerous diseases to, to research. One of the good things that's happened in the, in the research landscape in sarcoidosis over the last several years is that the sarcoidosis charities, so the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research in the US, and in the UK here, a charity called Sarcoidosis UK, uh, have done fantastic work, or uh, well, really their fundraisers have done fantastic work in raising funds uh, to support research into sarcoidosis. And um, uh, that's led to a number of research grants and research funding being given out. Um, that will aim to improve the knowledge of the research community and eventually um, find better treatments for sarcoidosis and maybe eventually to, to find a cure, which is, which is what everybody would like. And when so, we look, so it look, has been difficult, but things are looking up. When we look at the horizon right now, uh, is there a next great thing that we maybe can lean on that says a cure is right around the corner? Are there advancements or are we stuck? Where would you put us? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, for, for many decades until recently, we were a bit stuck actually. Um, and, uh, and, and, and there wasn't much progress. There have been some very interesting developments in the last few years. Um, so some researchers in Vienna, uh, led by uh, an excellent scientist called Thomas Beichart, um, have developed an animal model that looks for the first time very much like uh, sarcoidosis. It has many of the features of sarcoidosis. And one of the things that's been holding back research, John, is, is that we haven't had an animal model in which, which certain things can be tested before they go into, into clinical development. Um, and, and, and the uh, Vienna animal model uh, focuses on a on a particular cellular switch in immune cells called mTOR, M-T-O-R. Um, and it seems when this goes wrong or becomes uh, overactive in these macrophage cells, which form the core of the granuloma, this can then form granuloma to, granulomas that look uh, you know, exactly the same as in sarcoidosis. So this is very exciting. This was a very high impact publication in Nature Immunology a few years ago. And so, uh, looking at aspects of this mTOR switch and how we might be able to treat that um, is an exciting um, opportunity for the future. Now, there are drugs that block mTOR, uh, anti-cancer drugs. Uh, at the moment, they're, you know, we may be worried that they have, they're a little bit toxic or potential side effects, but there are options to develop new drugs or even to use different doses that may be worth, uh, may be worth looking at. So that's one very exciting development and something certainly that the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research in the US have been uh, very much supporting is the development of models, so laboratory models, animal models of granulomatous inflammation, which can be used to test out uh, new theories or potentially new drugs. Um, so I'm, I am encouraged that the funding landscape has improved and that there are uh, some very clever people around the world working on sarcoidosis now, uh, that gives me hope for the future. Well, I'm, I'm certainly glad to hear that. I hope people listening to this podcast are, are also glad to hear that. Uh, I think a, a key to future success will be to have people uh, make contributions to, in the United States, uh, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research so they can um, continue to do their good work and to make sure that, that people like you and your colleague in, uh, did you say Austria, uh, yeah. are, uh, you know, can, can move forward and hopefully we can develop a, a new approach to dealing with this autoimmune disorder and, and maybe solve multiple autoimmune disorders at the same time. I'm not sure. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, but it all comes down to finding that molecule that switches this thing off and on at the end of the day, does it not? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and being able to do that with 
you know, minimal or acceptable levels of toxicity or side effects. Um, and you know, maybe, John, that will come from looking at existing drugs or existing small molecules in development by the pharma industry. Um, because, again, because sarcoidosis is a rare disease, the pharma, the drug pharma industry, you know, it's difficult to get them interested. There's not much of a potential market as they see it there. So we may have to base our future testing, future treatments on, on variations of drugs that are already available, uh, what might be called repurposing. Um, and I think that, that may be an attractive approach. All right. Well, Dr. Simon Hart, we have been talking for about an hour now, and I appreciate your time greatly. And I, and I hope our listeners uh, now know more about sarcoidosis than they did when they first started in investing their time in this podcast. Is there anything else that you would like to add to the discussion before we go? Uh, not at all, John. It's been a very interesting discussion. Uh, it's been uh, great fun talking to you. And uh, thank you for inviting me to have this discussion. Very good. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully our paths will cross sometime in the future. Absolutely. Thanks again so much to Dr. Hart for taking the time to talk with us here on the Sark Fighter podcast today. And also, of course, for his work with patients, his work with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research and, and other organizations that are working to find cures and treatments. And uh, wow, I hope you learned something today that you didn't already know uh, why it's so difficult to diagnose and treat. It does seem like sarcoidosis is a moving target for researchers. Sometimes it goes away on its own, and then you don't know if it was the treatment or if it was just what's going on with the disease. It, uh, it's certainly... Uh, a, a difficult target for researchers. And you know, we'll be diving in a little deeper, I hope, in future episodes. That's the plan, maybe with Dr. Hart, maybe with other researchers. Uh, a note about this podcast, uh, my goal is to devote my time to this issue to make our lives a little bit more livable, maybe a little bit more understandable, both to ourselves and to others. And it would be nice if you could help me help the sarcoidosis community by spreading the word. Just tell one person about this podcast and ask them to listen. Also, uh, put a link to it on your social media, your Facebook, your Instagram, um, by the way, uh, you can follow Sark Fighter on Facebook and on Instagram. I just created those accounts this week as I sort of uh, work to find ways to get the word out about this new podcast. But please, if you would just ask one other person to listen, that's that's really what I'm looking for, or, or share it on your social media. Also, uh, let me know if you'd like to be interviewed and share your story. Uh, and then please, if you don't want to be interviewed, just send me an email about your fight. Let me, let me know what you think of the podcast uh, or, and let me know how you are dealing with sarcoidosis or the medications and the side effects so that I can share that with other listeners so we all know that we are not the only ones out there fighting this disease. It is rare. Most people I know don't know anybody else who has sarcoidosis. Um, uh, or if so, it's very few people, but maybe we can build this community. We can all listen together. We can all commiserate together and hopefully get through it together. Thanks again to Laura Drinkard for allowing me to share her struggles a little bit earlier in the podcast. And thank you again to Dr. Simon Hart. That's all for now. And I'll talk to you in the next Sark Fighter podcast. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the Sark Fighter Podcast. You may be wondering, what can I do to help? How can I be a part of the sarcoidosis solution? It's simple. Make a donation to KISS. Kick in to stop sarcoidosis. 100% of the money goes to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Look for a link in the show notes of the Sark Fighter Podcast.